very basic doctrine. I almost don't like preaching about salvation. Okay, and you go, well, why that's crazy? Why don't you want to preach about salvation? It's because I preach about salvation every week. Week, week in and week out, we knock on doors. Every door that gives us an opportunity, we preach the gospel. And on average, I probably get to preach the gospel twice every time we go out and knock doors. Okay, from start to finish. And so, you know, church isn't really about bringing in the unsaved and getting them the gospel and getting them saved. No, church is for the believers, okay, and then to grow from that point, okay, not to, not to just always be preaching on the gospel. And I've been to churches where you really go to church and all you really hear is the gospel. You know, it's preached over and over again. You're kind of wondering, hey, we've heard this for years. I think everybody in the church is saved. Or if they've heard it, for, they've been hearing it for this many times, but they still don't get it. I don't think they're going to get saved. And that's the kind of idea you get. And you think, look, it's time to move on. But because, you know, we, we are starting as a new church, we need to get through our foundational doctrines. I really want to cover the topic of salvation. Okay? That's not to say that I'll never preach on salvation at church. Of course I will. You know, every now and again, every sermon that I preach, I'm going to cover something about salvation here and there. Usually, okay? But I just don't want to have to dedicate a whole sermon um, every week on salvation. And with the memory verse, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you know, you could understand probably with that verse that this was going to, going to be about salvation. Let's look at that verse again. If you've got your Bibles, go back to Ephesians 2, if you've got it there. Ephesians 2, chapter 8. For by grace, you guys know what grace is? It's undeserved merit. Okay? Grace is something that's free. Okay? Undeserved merit. You don't deserve this, basically. Okay? For by grace are you saved. Well, that's good. But how? Through faith. And that's really what I'm going to be driving home today. That it's received through faith. And then it says, and that not of yourselves. You cannot save yourself. You know, God had to come and do the works so you can be saved. And that was through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gift of God, right? The gift, it's free. Gifts are free. You know, you receive a gift and you don't have to pay for it. If you have to pay for it, it's no longer a gift. It is the gift of God, verse 9, not of works. Not of works, okay? We'll cover that in detail soon. Lest any man should boast. So what's the danger that we get from, this, from these two verses is that a lot of people will think salvation is dependent upon themselves, dependent upon their works, and what, what happens if they believe that? They're going to boast about it, right? The fact that it's not of works is, is so that we don't boast about it. And if, if you go and you knock doors of people who are trusting in their good works for salvation, they believe it's by works, they believe it's by keeping the commandments, they're boasting of themselves, are they, are they not? Because you ask them, well, what do you think you need to do to go to heaven? Well, I'm a good person. Well, maybe they are a good person, but they're boasting of themselves. Okay? They're boasting of their ability to be clean and good. And I've seen this in people in church that ought to know better, that ought to know that salvation is something to boast in, in Christ. And yet when they, we ask them, oh, are you saved? Well, of course I'm saved. I've been going to church my whole life. I grew up in a Christian home. I'm a good person. Even people that have been in churches say the same thing. They boast in themselves rather than boast in Jesus Christ who's done all the works. Okay? So this is a very important doctrine. I would rather be wrong on everything in the Bible. Everything on the Bible. If you just pulled out a random chapter, Kevin, what's this about? I'd rather just get that wrong than to get salvation wrong. Okay? And I'd rather, I'd rather be wrong on everything but right on this than to be right on everything in the Bible but wrong on salvation. Okay, because this is the eternal destiny of your soul. This is the number one doctrine that matters the most. Okay, anybody that's unsaved, they shouldn't be wasting their time trying to understand all these other doctrines in the Bible. They need to understand what the true gospel is. Okay. So let's understand this. We talk about salvation. We use all these words, being saved. What do we need to be saved? Why do we need to be saved? What's this story about? So we need to start from the beginning. Please turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We need to understand 
why does man even need salvation, okay? Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Let's start with the story of Adam and Eve. You know, when God created Adam on the sixth day, He, he sent him in the Garden of Eden, right? He told Adam, hey, you need to look after this garden. That's the job I'm giving you. But in verse 16, he also says this to Adam. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. That's a pretty good deal. I mean, you know when people think about Christianity? When they think of God, they think of this God with all these rules. This God that doesn't want us to enjoy our life. Okay? They look at the Bible, they see all the commands. They say, wow, man, you know, I'd, I'd rather be without Christianity. I'd rather be without God. Because God wants to enforce all these rules upon us. But yet when he created man, what does it, what does it say? Of every tree of the garden that may freely eat. You know, God wants us to live a life of freedom. He wants us to be, uh, you know, have liberty in our lives. He gives us the ability to make decisions for ourselves. Okay? But here's the thing. And when God gives us commands and rules, it's to protect us. Because when we do sin, when we do break His law, it harms us and it harms the people around us. Look at verse 17. God gives us that one condition to Adam. It says, Adam, you can eat of every tree. Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt, thou shalt surely die. Adam, you can eat of every tree. You've got freedom, Adam. Except that one tree. You know, I'm going to test you. I'm going to test you out to see if you're going to be obedient to me, if you're going to love me and keep my commandments. There's just that one condition, Adam. You know, you would think, wow, you know, there's no way you're going to mess this up. You know, you've got so many trees to choose from, except that one. Now, when God says, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, did they die when they took of that tree? They did. It was not a physical death. It was a spiritual death, okay? And I know I've covered some of these thoughts when I preached on um, the dual nature of man, okay? But I do want to just cover some of these things once again very quickly because it's important to understand about our salvation. Now, I'll get you to keep a finger there in, first, uh, sorry, in Genesis. Please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Actually, no. You guys turn to Romans 7. Turn to Romans 7. I'll give you something else to turn to. Romans 7. Keep a finger in Genesis. Well, you don't really need to keep a finger because it's the first book of the Bible. It's pretty easy, right? But uh, Romans 7, I'm going to read from, to you from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. The Bible says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So the Bible is very clear. We have a soul, we have a spirit, and we have a body. Okay? Very clear that we're more than just this physical body that you see before you, right? There's more to me. Okay? If I were to die, my body's still there, but it's not living. Okay? There's life. There's this spirit. There's this soul that uh, is in this body. Okay? Now, look at Romans 7, verse 9. I know we've covered this before, but I think it's good to go through it again. Romans 7, verse 9. Paul speaking, he says, For I was alive without the law once. I mean, this makes no sense if you're thinking about a physical life or a physical death. Because it says, I was alive without the law once. And you go like, well, I mean, that's crazy, Paul, because you're alive now. That's why this book of Romans is being written. It's because you're alive. But then it says this, But when the commandment came, when the commandments of God came, sin revived and I died. Because without the commandments of God, you know, we don't know what it takes to basically be a sinner. Okay, if God never said, you know, thou shalt not bear false witness, you know, we shouldn't lie, then we wouldn't have the knowledge that lying is a sin. And Paul says, when I've understood the commandments of God, that's when I realized I'm a sinner and I died. Okay? That is spiritually. You died spiritually. Verse number 10. And the commandment... And you say, well, why? Is, is the commandment like a, a problem? You know? No. It says, and the commandment which was ordained to life. 
God has given us His commands so we can live an abundant life, so we can look after ourselves. God gives us boundaries, just like a parent gives their children boundaries, so they wouldn't hurt themselves, they wouldn't harm themselves. You know, I don't let my kids, for example, run, you know, open the front door and run to the front of the street. I don't know, in this day and age, with the crazy reprobates that are out there, the crazy pedophiles that are out there, kidnappers, you know, I, you know, we tell the kids, hey, you're not allowed to play outside, you can play in the backyard if you want. You know, you can play at the park when we're all ready to go there and, and be there. But, you know, we don't let our kids run, run wild at the front of the house. You know, we put boundaries in place and we're trying to protect them. Same thing. He's found that when he broke those boundaries, that God put those commands, it killed him. It killed his spirit. Verse 11. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and it slew me. So what killed Paul? Was it the commands of God? No. It was his sin. It was his sin that slew him. It was what, it's the sin that killed him. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So I don't want you to confuse the commandments of God as, as a bad thing. Okay? It is the commandments that make us realize that we're sinners in the sight of God. And when we, we realize that we're sinners in the sight of God, just like what was promised to Adam and Eve, they would surely die when you finally understand your sinful condition before God. Okay? That is when your soul dies. And I believe this happens at a pretty early age. You know, once a child has grown up and realizes, boy, you know, I'm not perfect after all. I've done wrong in my life. I've disobeyed my parents. I've disobeyed God. Okay? And the commands of the, of the Lord are written in our hearts in the New Testament. You know, you don't need to be someone that knows the Bible necessarily to know what's right and wrong these days. Because God has written that on our fleshly hearts as well. And of course, so we have the commands of God. And I'll just quickly read to you 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4, which says, Because what is sin after all? Since it says here, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, or you break the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Okay? Means you've broken God's laws. That's what makes you a sinner. That's what makes you spiritually die. Okay? And we spoke about those three parts in a man, the body, the soul, and the spirit. And just very quickly, you know, every man, everybody that lives on this earth has a dead spirit if they're not saved. Okay, because they, they got the commands of God and, and sin slew them. Okay, but because they're spiritually dead, if they ever physically die, their soul will leave their body with their dead spirit and suffer eternity in hell. But if they're saved, they have a living spirit and that soul will go with the living spirit to be in heaven. Okay, so we must understand the need for salvation. Okay, man must be saved. Go to Genesis, go back to Genesis now. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It'll take a while to go through the whole story of Adam and Eve, but let's just hit the important bits here. You guys know the story, I hope, you know, where Satan tempts Eve. To partake of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were not supposed to, and she does. She eats of that, then she takes it to Adam. Adam, knowing better, still partakes of that fruit, and they both have sinned against the Lord God. Okay? Now, once they have sinned, look at verse number 7. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It says, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So obviously they were naked, you know, and there's nothing wrong with a husband and wife uh, being naked before one another. But what we see, what's happened here, is once they've sinned, they had the shame of nakedness. Okay? The shame of nakedness fell upon them when their eyes were open, when they realized they had sinned against God and they wanted to hide themselves. They wanted to hide themselves. What do they do? They, they get the fig leaves. And by the way, this is man's first attempt to be made right with God. They're ashamed of their sin. They realize they're naked. Then they get the fig leaves. They go to a plant. They get the, the vines or whatever, the leaves. And they sew for themselves an apron, right? And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. This is man's first attempt to be righteous before God. 
And what kind of salvation is that? It's a works-based salvation, right? They take the leaves, they make these aprons for themselves, and they cover themselves. All right. Now look at verse 21. Let's look at verse 21. Were these fig leaves suitable to God? Did God accept these fig leaves to cover the shame? No. It's not good enough for God. Look at verse 21. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. So when God saw those fig leaves, that wasn't good enough. Okay? Man's work, man's attempt at righteousness, man's attempt to be right before God is not good enough. There's nothing they can do now that they have sinned against God to make up for it. And so what does God have to do? Those fig leaves aren't good enough. It represents the works of the hands of man. God himself had to take an animal, right? Because he had to take the coat of skin. He had to kill that animal. He had to shed the blood of that animal. And with the coats of skins from that animal, he clothed Adam and Eve. Now we see what it takes to be made right before God. Now we see what it takes to be able to stand before a holy and just God. What is it? The shedding of blood. The shedding of innocent blood. Whatever animal that was, and it could have been a lamb. Okay, this is the first picture that we get of Jesus Christ. Okay, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate lamb of God. We see that it took the shedding of blood, the death of an innocent, to cover the sins of man. And that was acceptable to God. That's the lesson that God had left Adam and Eve once they had sinned. The shedding of blood is so important, so important in the Bible. Okay. Now go to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4 verse 4. Genesis chapter 4 verse 4. <coughs> we now have the story of Adam and Eve uh, having their children, Cain and Abel. Okay. Genesis 4 chapter 4. Chapter 4 verse 4. The Bible says, And Adam knew, his, knew Eve his wife. Okay? And she conceived and bare Cain. So Cain's their firstborn son and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she bare again, sorry, and, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So we can see what professions they get into. Abel becomes a shepherd. Okay? He looks after sheep, he looks after cattle. But Cain is a farmer. He works the ground. He tills the ground. He grows, you know, fruits and veggies. Nothing wrong with any of those jobs. Okay? It's not like one was sinful and one was righteous. No. They're both just working, making a living for themselves, following after the footsteps of their dad that was left work to do to look after the Garden of Eden. They take on that responsibility of a man to obviously work and look after their own families. Verse number three. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So we see that both Cain and Abel have this knowledge. I'm sure Adam and Eve passed it on to them that they would have to bring a sacrifice before God. Okay. And again, what was that sacrifice? It was an animal. It was the shedding of blood that was needed to be made right with God, to be made righteous with God. And so we can see in verse number four that the Lord has respect unto Abel for his offering. Why? Because Abel brought uh, the first things of his flock. He took a uh, lamb and shed the blood of that lamb, and that was acceptable to God. Whereas Cain, he brings the fruit of the ground. He brings his works. He brings the labor of him, you know, growing plants and, and uh, you know, fruit trees and, and vegetables. Look, I'm sure he had, a, he had a, you know, the, the right mentality. I've got to come in and give a sacrifice to God. What can I give? I can give the works of my hand. But he didn't learn the lesson. He learned the, the, the wrong lesson that Adam and Eve had, putting together those fig leaves. You know, the, the, trying to be righteous with the works of man, that's not good enough for God. You can never be good enough to be made right with God. And that's what Cain's sacrifice uh, reflects. Works-based salvation. 
And the reason why God had respect for Abel's was because it was the shedding of blood. Verse number five. But, uh, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. Listen to me. If you think you're going to make it to heaven based on your good works, God has no respect for that. <coughs> no respect. Not even a little bit of respect. No. No respect. Okay? And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And let me say to you, we, this church here believes that salvation is by grace, through the shedding of blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection, and it's by faith alone, and the sacrifice has been provided by God, and we fully trust and rely on Jesus Christ. That's what we believe for salvation. Okay? And let me say to you now, People that believe in a works gospel, just like Cain, their countenance will fall if you tell them that, and they'll become very wroth, very wrathful, become very angry. You know what? You think it's just believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes! That's what it is. That's what it takes to be made right with God. But for whatever reason, those that are trying to work their way to heaven, they don't like this message. They don't like it. Just like Cain, they become very angry. Okay? Uh, verse number 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. Look at this. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And that's the story from Cain and Abel till today. True believers throughout the centuries have been slain for preaching the gospel. Salvation by grace through faith on the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. From Cain till today. Thank God we live in a free nation. Thank God we live in a nation that allows us to have our religious beliefs. You know, without the persecution, well, you know, for now at least, without the persecution, without being put to death. But there are places in this world that you take this message there and they'll put you to death. Okay, it's still happening today. Now let me just read to you very quickly. <coughs> Actually, you know what? Turn to Hebrews 11. Turn to Hebrews 11. I'm just trying to work out what verses to get you to turn to so it makes it a bit, we can get through this a bit quicker. But turn to Hebrews 11 verse 4. Hebrews 11 verse 4. I want to drive home exactly what uh, Abel was doing when he offered that blood sacrifice, okay? We get a bit more information here in Hebrews 11, verse 4. The Bible reads, By faith, okay, don't forget those words. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, uh, he being dead, yet speaketh. So even though uh, Abel was, was murdered, by his most excellent sacrifice, he still speaks to us today. Speaks that his sacrifice was acceptable to God. Because it was by faith. It was by faith of the shedding of blood that was going to make him right before God. And, uh, you know, when people talk about Abraham as one of the key saints of the Old Testament... Let me just read to you something very quickly in Galatians 3 8. You say in Hebrews, because I'm going to get you to turn somewhere else. But Galatians 3 8 says this And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. A lot of people make the mistake and think that the gospel was only, is only preached in the New Testament. No. And, and, and you have some false teachers that will say the way people were saved in the Old Testament was by works. I don't understand how they even get that idea. When you see what Cain and Abel presented very early on, the works was rejected. Faith on, on the shedding of blood was accepted. Okay? But it said there in, in Galatians 3.8 uh, that through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Abraham knew the gospel. Okay? Now, he probably didn't know the name of Jesus Christ, but God himself preached the gospel to Abraham. 
What is the gospel? It's a death, burial, and resurrection. I'll just read to you very quickly. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, which says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, uh, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. And if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain, for I have delivered unto you first of all uh, that which I also received. Pay attention now. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So what's the Gospel? The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us here in Galatians chapter 3 that Abraham was preached the Gospel directly from God. Abraham knew about this death, burial, and resurrection that was going to make him righteous. And he received that in faith. Have a look at Hebrews 11. You guys should step in Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews 11 verse 17. Hebrews 11 verse 17. Hebrews 11 verse 17 to 19. You guys know the story, don't you, of Abraham... God asking Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, right? And Abraham gets to the point where he's literally got the knife to, to, to kill his son up in the air, and then he gets stopped, okay? But look what Hebrews 11 verse 17 says. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. You might say, Kevin, that's crazy. How can a father, even if God tells him? I mean, if I heard a voice, Kevin, sacrifice, you know, Nicholas is my oldest son, sacrifice Nicholas. I'll be wondering, what is this voice? Is this really the voice of God telling me to kill my own son? Okay. It might sound crazy, but have a look at this. It's not crazy to Abraham because the promises were offered unto him. Uh, but look at verse 18. Of whom it was said... That in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now look at verse 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up. So Abraham knew if I, if I kill Abel, that God will raise him up. Even from the dead. From whence also he received him in a figure. Okay? He said, why? Why, why did he know that I, you know, if he killed... This is what... So he was okay with it. He said, oh, well, I, I can kill my own son because I know God will raise him up. I say, well, how did he know that? It's because God preached the gospel unto Abraham. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then it says there in verse 19, did you notice? From whence also he received him in a figure. He knew that his son Isaac was a figure of the ultimate sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if his death was going to figure the death of Christ then the resurrection of Christ would be figured in his son. He knew the gospel even back then. He knew it. Though again, he, he probably didn't know the name of Jesus Christ. I don't think that was revealed until the New Testament. Okay? Um, <coughs> can you guys go back to Genesis, please? Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 verse 6. Because I want you to understand this. In the Old Testament, when they shed the blood of animals, that did not cover anybody's sins. Okay? They were not like made right with God because of the blood of the animals. But the blood of the animals, the picture of Isaac being sacrificed, which you know obviously didn't happen, but the shedding of blood, they were all a figure, a foreshadowing. They were all an object's lesson. Pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ and His ultimate sacrifice. Okay? We today, 2,000 years after the sacrifice of Christ, we can look back and see what Jesus Christ has done for us. We have the enlightenment of the New Testament. We have that full revelation, that full understanding. You know, we're better off than the Old Testament saints. But the Old Testament saints, they knew this promise of God. They knew the gospel, at least, in pictured form. And so they were looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, though they didn't have all the information, they didn't have that full revelation that we do have now in the New Testament. Okay? 
But look at Genesis 22 verse 6. This is again back to the story of Abraham and Isaac. The Bible says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And look, this is the picture of Christ. You know, this is the picture of Jesus Christ taken on, on the cross on his back and carrying that to Calvary. This is now Isaac taking on the wood of the burnt offering upon his back. Okay? And uh, let's keep reading. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both went of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? It's all ready to go, Dad. We've got all the equipment, but where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And I love verse number 8. And this only makes sense if you've got a King James Bible. Okay, The, the modern versions mess this up. Verse number 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. The Bible says here, my son. This is only worded like this in the King James Bible. It's not worded like this in your modern version. I wish I had the modern versions to show you, but I don't. You can look it up yourself. It says, my son, God will provide who? Himself a lamb. All right? It's not just he was going to provide it himself, but he's providing himself a lamb. Okay? And of course, and I'll just read to you. You guys know the story. John the Baptist, when Jesus Christ comes to be baptized... John the Baptist says in John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, uh, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Okay, Behold the Lamb of God. This is the promise all the way back to Abraham. Abraham knew that God would provide himself the Lamb. It will be God himself. Jesus Christ is God. You know, it's not just man. But he's 100% God. God definitely did provide himself the lamb. The lamb which taketh away the sin of the world. And let me just read to you quickly. Uh, you guys maybe turn to Romans while I read this to you. Turn to Romans. I'm going to read from you uh, to you from Acts 20 verse 28. Talking to pastors here. It says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which... The Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God. Now pay attention to the next words. To feed the church of God, which he have purchased with his own blood. So the church of God, you as saved individuals, have been purchased by his own blood. Whose own blood? God's own blood. Okay. When Jesus Christ was on that cross, when his blood was shed... Not just in the, in the nailings of his hands and his feet, but when he was beaten, when his beard was ripped off, when he was whipped, when his back was whipped and his blood was being shed, when that crown of thorns was thrust upon his face, upon his head, all that blood that he shed was not just the blood of man. The Bible says it was the blood of God. Okay, God's blood was shed so we can be saved. Okay, this is why the blood of goats and bulls and sheep were never enough. It was just a picture. It was just an object lesson. So people can be reminded of the ultimate sacrifice that would come. The Lord Jesus Christ. Not just the blood of man, but the blood of God. Okay. Now Romans 3.23. So what I want to do now, I hope I've shown you. I hope I've shown you, first of all, why we need to be saved. Because we're spiritually dead when we're not saved, right? And that needs to be made alive in Christ Jesus. And the salvation that God came... The plan that he has is the shedding of blood. Okay? Pictured throughout the Old Testament, but ultimately to point us to Christ. The whole Bible is Christ centric. Okay? Uh, Jesus Christ says, I mean, that all the prophets give witness of him. Okay? Everything in the Old Testament, whether it's obvious or not, somehow it's pointing us to Christ. A lot of these figures, a lot of these, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, just just uh, Moses when he when he goes, they were lacking water, if you remember, that he had to smoke that rock and that came uh, flowing uh, water. That was a picture of Jesus Christ being that rock and out of him coming uh, the, the waters, the, 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 of, of the, the living waters out of Christ. Okay, It's through Christ. The manna from heaven. 
When, when the manna, you know, that bread from heaven descended because the Israelites were hungry, Jesus Christ says, that's a picture of my body that was given to you. Okay? I mean, there's a lot of things in the Bible, a lot of imagery. You know, Moses and that, and that serpent, the bronze serpent, when he was lifted up and people that looked up to, him, up to the serpent were hewed by the snake bites. That was a picture of Jesus Christ being lifted up. I mean, the Old Testament is full of images and pictures of Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, even Israel, even the story of Israel when they left Egypt, you know, God looks back at that and says that that's a picture of Christ. Because if you remember the story of Christ when he was born, uh, King Herod wanted to kill him and they fled, they fled into Egypt and they came out of Egypt again later on. And that was a picture of what Israel did when Israel came out of Egypt. That was ultimately picturing Jesus Christ. When he would go into Egypt and come out of Egypt uh, when King Herod. I mean, there are so many things in the Bible that point us back to Christ. And so it's, it's only through Jesus Christ that we can obtain salvation. It's only through his shed blood that we can be righteous before God. Okay? Now, nothing that I've said so far is controversial. Any church that calls themselves Christians, okay? Uh, Baptists, Protestants, even the Catholics, even the Orthodox churches, even some of the cults. I mean, it wasn't just two weeks ago, I had a Jehovah Witness come to my door, and I'm trying to be polite, so look, I'm not, I'm not interested, you know, like, you know, we, we believe very differently about who Jesus Christ is. And the Jehovah Witness said to me, yeah, but, you know, Jesus is our Savior. You know, Jesus Christ came and, and died and shed his blood for us. You know, everything they're saying... They know how, they've been trained how to speak to a Baptist. Okay? And so there's nothing that I've said here that's really controversial. Okay? And so you might be wondering, well, maybe we're, everyone's a Christian and everyone's saved. Well, there is, there is something very important that they miss. Okay? Now, what I'm going to go through now is basically the plan of salvation that I tend to go through. Well, not, not 100% exactly. I've got some other passages here uh, that I go through to, to explain the gospel to someone door to door. Okay, so Romans 3.23, I'm sure you all kind of start this, if, start here, or well, I don't know if you all do, but I would encourage you, if you haven't got a plan for salvation, this is a good plan to follow. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. And because we've all broken God's laws, we've come short of the glory of God. You know what that means? It means God's glory is perfect. He's righteous. He's holy. He's without sin. And because we're sinners, we come short of His glory. We can't be right before God on our own merits. Because even one sin, even just being a sinner, makes us fall short of His glory. And of course, Romans 6.23, you can turn there if you want. Romans 6.23 is where I would, where I would go next. Which says, for the wages... You know, if you've got a job, you earn a wage, it's your payment. It's what's deserving to you, right? You go to work, you do the hours, you do the job, and then at the end of the week or the fortnight, whatever it is that you get paid, you're deserving of your paycheck. And yet we've got to, we're deserving of something because of our sins. It says in Romans 6.23, for the wage of sin is death. We deserve death, okay, for our sins. That's what God said when they took of that, that fruit. You know, that they will surely die on that day. That's the payment. That's the wages of sin. And then where I would normally take someone after this is Revelation 21 verse 8. Uh, well, actually, probably mm, sometimes. It just depends on what I'm speaking to. But of course, I'm sure you guys know these passages. You're very familiar with them. But the fearful... So it goes through a list of sins, you know, of people that, that are, are, are worthy of, of going to the lake of fire, going to hell. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers. And you know, in the past, I used to stop here. Where it goes, and murderers. And go, you know, I mean, we've probably never murdered anybody, right? And then usually everyone at the door would go, yeah, I've never murdered anybody. I've stopped doing that now. I'll tell you why. <laughs> I'll tell you why now, actually. <laughs> when I was in, in Detroit for the Solomon, I don't know if you all know that, but I went to the Solomon Conference in Detroit. Detroit's a pretty messed up city. And I was talking to this one black guy at the door, and I got to murderers, and I was like, I said that, you know, you know, we, we haven't committed murder, right? And he paused. And he was a bit slow, first of all, so well, maybe he's a bit slow. And I just kind of said the question again, and he goes, well, yeah, I have, but it was an accident. 
<laughs> you know, it was just once, it was just once that it was an accident. I was like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> talking to a murderer. So I didn't say, I didn't ask that question anymore because maybe, maybe people are, there definitely are murderers out there. Uh, he got saved eventually, thank God, you know, he got saved. And murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, people that worship idols and all liars. And I love that bit, right? Because they say, no, I'm not a murderer. But then you show them, well, oh, no, liars. And, the, you know, unless they're lying right now, they have to admit they've at least told a lie. And if they're really honest, they have to admit they've told hundreds or thousands of lies in their whole life. Okay, even lies send us to hell. It says, all lies shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay, because the wages of sin is death, not just physical death, but spiritual death in the lake of fire. Okay, a lot of Christians today don't even want to, want to talk about hell. They don't want to talk about sin. I mean, my mum and dad know this. We went to a Baptist church. My, even my parents would say the pastor would never even mention sin, would never mention hell. It's not what people want to hear. They just want to hear the nice things, right? God loves you. God wants you in heaven, whatever, you know? No, you know, we need to show people that they go into hell if they reject Jesus Christ. And then I usually I'll say to them, well, you know, do you think God wants us to go to hell? And they'll say, well, no, God doesn't want us to go to hell. Usually that's what they'll say. And then, so I'll take them to Romans 5.8. You don't need to turn there. Oh, I don't know. You guys are in Romans. I guess you can. Romans 5.8. You guys know it. But God commendeth his love toward us. God loves us. You know, we, we serve a God of these amazing extremes. You know, extreme that he would send someone to the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. But then this extreme love as well. That he would love his enemies. All right. And that, uh, sorry, what was I reading? 5.8. Uh, love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was able to look down at the earth and not say, well, they're trying their best. They're trying to be good. They're trying to serve me. No. While they're sinners, while they're breaking my laws, while they hate me, while they want nothing to do with me, I'm still going to send Jesus Christ to die for them. That's the other extreme of God, right? There's this amazing love that he would be able to send his own son to die for, for, the, for a sinful world. While the sinners, while they're committing sin, he's going to send Jesus Christ to die for them. Okay, and then, uh, I mean, I'll just quickly, this is not really what I turn to, but I'll just quickly read to you 2 Corinthians 5.21. The Bible says, For he hath made him, speaking of Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, but uh, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus Christ did not just come to die on the cross and shed his blood. He lived a perfect life. He kept all the commands of God. He was without sin. Okay, He was the innocent uh, man. He was our substitute. He took on the payment. Just like Adam and Eve, they're the ones that ate of the fruits. And yet God had to take an innocent animal that had nothing to do with those events and shed its blood to cover their shame and nakedness with a coat of skin. Same thing with Jesus Christ. He was the innocent party in this. He did not even sin. And yet all our sins were put on Christ as though he had done them. All my sins, all your sins, the sins of the whole world, the sins of every generation, all the way back to Adam and Eve, the sins of every generation to come until the Lord comes back. And even beyond that, right? Because there's still sinners in the millennium. Even beyond that, Jesus Christ came and died for the sins of every man. And then obviously Romans 6.23, we read a bit of it. We said, for the wages of sin is death, but we didn't finish it. But it ends with, but the gift of God, the gift of God, guys, the free gift. Okay, gifts are free. Gifts do not require you to make a purchase. You don't, you're not required to work for a gift. Gifts are free. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay, how did God pay for the gift? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. His death, burial, and resurrection. His sacrifice. His substitution, death, the atonement of His blood that was shed abundantly for us all. And again, this is a good message. No one really rejects this. Not even the Catholics reject this. Christianity in general receive this. Okay, and I'm telling you this because this is very important. You're going to talk to someone that calls themselves a Christian. You're going to talk to someone that says they're saved. 
And you're going to ask them, well, you know, what did God do for us? You know, what do we need to do to be saved? And they'll be like, well, Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross for our sins. And if you're not trained, if you don't, if you don't have the wisdom, you're going to conclude, well, this person must be saved. Right? This person must be saved because they're giving the right answers. They're, they're giving the right answers that they're a sinner. They're giving the right answers that they can't make it to heaven on their own. They're giving the right answers that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and shed his blood for them. This is generally accepted by everybody that calls themselves a Christian. Even the cults. Even the cults would admit to all this, pretty much. Okay? But here's where the controversy is. How do I receive salvation? How do I make sure that the blood of Christ is placed upon my life? How do I make sure that um, uh, His righteousness is imputed upon me? That's where the controversy is. Not what God did, but how do I apply that to my life? And you have two choices. The way of Cain, you bring your works, or the way of Abel, by faith. That's, those are the only two options. Biblical Christianity is by faith. And yet others that are so-called Christians would still say no, it's by works. Even when they still understand this whole process that Jesus Christ has done for them. Okay? So the question isn't necessarily, what did God do for us? That's not the controversy. The controversy is, how do we receive the gift of God? How do we receive it? You guys, uh, which, I'll get you to turn to John chapter 1 verse 12. John chapter 1 verse 12. And while you're turning there, I'm just going to read to you, because I know a lot of you know this anyway. Acts 16 verse 30. The clearest question that comes out... Um, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the best question you could have, someone could possibly ask you. I'd get excited if someone just came up to me. Kevin, what must I do to be saved? That would be such a good question, right? Because you kind of have to get, make people want that question. But if they could just come with that question, that would be so fantastic. How did they answer? Verse 31, and they said, go to church. Read your Bible. No. Get baptized. No. Stop sinning. Repent of your sins. Turn from your life of sins. Turn from habitual sins. No. That's not the answer. You know, uh, keep the commands of God. Keep the Ten Commandments. No. Look, everything I'm saying to you right now is what Christians out, Christians out there say. That's how you receive it. Okay? Do the works. Go to church. Show a good life. Should be a good example. Give yourself to Jesus. I don't know. What else do people say? Um, ask God to... I don't know what people say. You know, people say a lot of things. And over and over again, it's basically keep the commandments. Keep the commandments. Do the works. No, the answer is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's by faith, guys. The receiving of it is by faith. It's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not Cain's way. Cain's way is not going to get you there. Okay? You're in John chapter 1 verse 12. We talk about how do we receive it? How do we receive Jesus Christ? The Bible says, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. How? Even to them that believe on His name. Right? Does it say, even to them that do the works? Even to them that keep the commandments? Even to them that get baptized? No. Even to them that believe on His name, Jesus Christ. Turn to John 3.16. I'll get you to turn to a lot of John passages right now. John 3.16, you guys know it. For God so loved the world that He gave... By the way, it's a gift. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever repents from their sins... No. Oh, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe. Believe. Faith. Go up to the verse before that. Verse 15. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Guys, how do you receive it? How do you receive the gift of God? How do you receive salvation? How do you get eternal life? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith alone? Look. That's where the controversy is. Churches today that are filled with supposedly the right gospel 
are preaching the right gospel. And let me tell you now, are filled with lost people. Churches after churches. Churches that you think should know better. But they don't want to offend the congregation. They don't tell the congregation, hey, you're still trusting in works. You need to put your faith in Christ 100%. You need to believe in Him. I don't know why. I don't know why people are afraid. Well, I guess I know why. Because Cain killed Abel. That's why. There's going to come persecution if you preach the truth. That it's by faith alone on Jesus Christ. That's the, that's the reason why a lot of churches ignore this. Go to verse 18. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that what? How do you condemn yourself? He that believeth not is condemned already, right? That's how you condemn yourself to hell. You don't believe. You reject Jesus. Because he have not what believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That verse alone, three times. Believe, believe, believe. John 3 38. Sorry, 36. John 3 36. He that believeth on the Son hath. What's hath? Present tense. Hath everlasting life. If you've placed your faith on Christ today, you have everlasting life right now. Right now. Everlasting, lasts forever, never ends. You've got it. Doesn't matter how you mess up your life tomorrow or the rest of your life. It doesn't matter if you don't keep the Ten Commandments for the rest of your life. You have it because it's Christ. It's been paid for by Jesus Christ. Half everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son, sorry, not yeah, the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Those that are still trusting in their works. Or, or, yeah, it's Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But I also think you need to do your part. The wrath of God still abides on you today. You're still on your way to hell. Because you've not put your full faith and trust on Jesus Christ alone. Go to chapter 6, please. John chapter 6, verse 35. <clears throat> Aren't these easy verses? Like, you just read these, and it makes sense, right? Those that want to corrupt salvation will always find other verses that are just not that clear and, and, and teach and twist the scriptures, right? The Bible's crystal clear what it takes to be saved. John 6, 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Okay? So you come to Jesus and you believe on Jesus and you'll never thirst again. Look at verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me. Who sent Jesus Christ? The Father. This is the Father's will. Okay? That everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. I will. Jesus says, I will do it. You will be saved. You will have those resurrected bodies at the rapture. Guaranteed if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you receive the gift through faith. Verse 47. 47, same chapter. John chapter 6, verse, verse 47. <laughs> verily, verily. I love it. As soon as Jesus says those words. Truly, truly. This is verified. Twice. Verily, verily I say unto you. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Believe in everlasting life. You have it today if you do that. John chapter 7. Go to chapter 7 verse 38. John 7 38. Young Kevin, you're just driving the same points. I mean, yeah, that's what the Bible teaches, right? But let's make sure this is the one doctrine that we don't ever mess up. This is the one doctrine we always stay true to. Okay? If I ever come and preach another gospel, then Luke, you're in charge. You've got to kick me out. Okay? <laughs> or you get the other men. If I preach another gospel, guys, honestly, you kick me out as soon as possible. Okay? Because this is, we need to understand what the Bible says here. John uh, chapter 7. Did I say chapter 7? Yeah? yeah. Verse, uh, verse uh, 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said. What? As the pastor has said? No! As the scripture have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay? Believing on Jesus Christ. John chapter 11, verse 15. Uh, sorry, 25. John 11, 25. John 11, 25. I love John 11, 25. 
It's so good. Look at this. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Uh, yeah, so it's believing in him. And then verse 26. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? He's saying, do you believe that it's belief? <laughs> That's what it is, right? It's not, do you believe it's what? Do you believe it's cleaning up your life? Do you believe it's church attendance? No. Do you believe it's belief? You know, I mean, how, you know, do you believe that it's belief? That it's, you know, they believe that you believe. You know, it's belief. It's faith in Christ. It can't be any more simple. That's why I love John 11, 25 and 26. Right? Do you believe that it's belief? And then say, well, Kevin, you're just showing us John. You're just showing us the book of John. Look, I, I can show you. I, I got a list at home. It's on my computer. I can pull it out. No, I don't have it here. I got it at home. But I, I could pull out a list of about over 100 verses where it's just by faith. It's just by belief alone. Okay, just a memory verse. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's throughout the whole Bible. It's even in the Old Testament. It's found everywhere. That salvation by grace through faith. Okay, and faith is a noun for, uh, for belief. Belief is a verb and faith is the noun. Because the Bible doesn't use um, belief all that much. It uses unbelief, but the word belief you won't find, I think this only appears once in your Bible, and the preferred noun that's used is faith. Okay, but these two things are the same. Go to John chapter 20, verse 31. John chapter 20, verse 31. Just to wrap this up now. So the reason why I'm just pulling out of John, number one, just to make our, our Bible, you know, going through the Bible a lot easier, just to prove this point. But also because the book of John is written for one main purpose. Okay? The book of John is very special compared to the rest of the Bible. Because the rest of the Bible is written to the believers. Okay? That's not to say that the unbeliever can't profit from other books of the Bible. But the book of John is the only book that's specifically written to the unbeliever. Look at this in John chapter 20, verse 31. John chapter 20, verse 31. John says, the writer, But these are written, why are they written? That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. That's why it's written, that the unbeliever would believe. What? That Jesus is the Christ, and the Son of God, by the way. <coughs> not, not that He's the Father or the Holy Spirit. That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that believing ye might have, that ye might have life through his name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. People turn around and say, Well, hold on, just believe, like just just know the facts. Is that what? Just know the facts that Jesus Christ died, his blood was shed for us. No. That's what I'm saying to you. Christianity in general, loving Catholic Catholicism and Orthodox, whatever, they all know those facts. They just don't know how to receive it. They reject salvation through faith they like the idea of god coming and sacrificing jesus christ but they don't like the idea that all we need to do is put our faith in that to be saved because they still want to bring the works they still want to bring the traditions of man they still want to bring the religion of cain and corrupt the gospel can you guys turn to romans chapter 4 please <laughs> romans chapter 4 sorry if i'm going a bit long I only get to preach to you guys once a week, so, you know, I'm not so worried about the time. <laughs> Maybe I should be. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. <coughs> Let me drive this home. This is, this is very, very important, okay? I find that, again, a lot of pastors, a lot of Christians that have been saved for a long time don't even know this truth. Go ask a pastor, go, just go ask a random, I don't know, if you're not a pastor, go ask them, how were saints saved in the Old Testament? Just ask them that simple question. They honestly don't know, they don't know. A lot of them just do not know this, right? I want to give you the answer straight away. <laughs> Romans chapter 4 verse 1. Romans chapter 4 verse, I already gave you the answer, right? We're talking about Abraham and he was saved, he knew the gospel. Romans chapter 4 verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father... As pertaining to the flesh have found. For if Abraham <coughs> sorry, for if Abraham were justified by works, 
Now, was Abraham justified by works? No, it says, if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. Remember, that's what Ephesians 2 and 9 said. If you could be justified by your own works, then you're going to glory in yourself. You're going to boast in yourself, but not before God. Okay? Look at verse number 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. How were the Old Testament saints saved? By believing God. By believing what he had revealed to them. Okay? That was saved by faith. And when they did that, it was accounted unto him for righteousness. What righteousness? The imputed righteousness of Christ. Look at verse number um, 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. So if salvation was something that we had to work for, then God would be indebted to then give us salvation because of our works. Okay? But it's not of debt. It's of grace. For by grace are you saved. Right? Verse number 5. But to him, now pay attention to the next words. Because there's still someone out here, I'm not saying this in this church, but maybe that listen to this, who will say, <laughs> no, you're still going to work a little bit, Kevin. Look, verse number 5. But to him that worketh not. Pay attention to that. Him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In order for you to be saved, you need to stop trusting in your works. Stop trusting your ability to keep the commands. Stop trusting your ability to stop sinning. Okay, because sin is the transgression of the law. And if you think, oh, if I'm going to stop sinning, well, that means you're trying to keep the law to be saved. You're trying to keep the works of the law to be saved. No. Stop trusting in your works and believe that it's by faith. Okay? Verse number six. Even as David, that's King David, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. Without works. Let's make that clear. It's by grace through faith. Okay? How were the Old Testament saints saved? By believing. Right? Through faith. By grace. Through faith. Without works. And let me just say to you, if, if someone says to you, if a pastor or a church leader says to you that was saved by works, that is a false prophet. Okay? That is a false prophet. You need to get away from that person as, as quickly as you can. Uh, let me see. Uh, let's have a look. If you guys can turn to turn to John chapter 6, and I'm just going to read some verses before you get there. Go to John chapter 6. Let me just finish this. Uh, I'll, I'll read to you Titus 3.5. Titus 3.5. And this is a very common verse. The Bible says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which is shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. So not by the works of our, not by our righteousness, but God's mercy. God's mercy for man, His love toward man is what saved us. Okay, Through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Hopefully you guys got to John 6. I'll just read to you Galatians 2.16 before we get there. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Knowing this. It's ob- it should be obvious by now, by the time we get to Galatians. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. Now, are the works of the law good for us? Are they profitable for us? Yes, they are. We should keep the commands of God, but we, we, that's not what's going to save us. Right? We do that so we can, uh, once we're saved, we do that to maintain a, re- a right relationship with God. To be able to fellowship and abide with God. To make sure that we don't destroy our lives on this earth and, and do what we can to serve God. That's the reason for the works of the law. Please don't think that I'm against the works of the law. I am not. But I am downright against it for salvation. Because that's what's going to damn a man if you're trusting the works of the law. Okay? It's, it's by faith. Uh, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. No one. Not from Adam, 
Not to the last man to ever be born will ever be justified by the works of the law. Now you guys should be in John 6.28. I love this, this, these verses as well, okay? Um, I'm almost done now, guys. I appreciate your patience. Uh, these are some, some Jews that come up to Jesus and they, they ask this question. And they said unto him, they, they said unto Jesus, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Right? They want to do the works. They want to work. But they think so highly of themselves. What, what, what do they want to work? The works of God. Okay? Now, before we read 29, if you have time, you can do this study at home. Look up that phrase, works of God or work of God. Okay? And if you do that, every single time, do you know who does that work? God. That's why it's called the works of God. That's why it's called the work of God. Because it's a work that only God can do. It's not a work that man can do. And these Jews come up to Jesus and tell, tell us how we can do the works of God. It's not your business, my friend. That's God's work to do. Let me just quickly show you this in Ecclesiastes 8.17. It says, uh, Then I beheld all the work of God. Now look at this. He's beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under, under the sun. A man can't even figure it out how to do the works of God. Because though a man labor to seek it out, just like these Jews are, they're laboring to find out how to do the works of God, yet he shall not find it. Yea, rather, though a wise man think to know it, there are some men that think they know the works of God, yet shall he not be able to find it. Hey, God's work is God's work. Man cannot work the works of God. And when it comes to salvation, it was God that had to provide Himself the Lamb. It was, it was Christ that had to come and keep the laws perfectly. It was Christ that had to come and shed His blood. Who worked the works of God? It was Jesus Christ. It was God Himself. Right? So how does Jesus Christ answer them in verse 29? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on Him whom thou hast sent. You want to do the works? It's not works. It's that you believe on Him, Jesus Christ, whom He hath sent. The work has been done. Jesus Christ will ultimately do that on the cross and His resurrection. And all they needed to do was believe on Him. But do you notice how they wanted to work the works of God? No, Jesus says, hey, believe. Believe on me. Okay? And, um... You know, you probably say, well, that's, that's too simple, Kevin. And people mock us, and they say, this is easy believism. That's what the Bible says, it's belief, right? Now, I don't subscribe so much to that idea, easy believism. It was easy for me, because I grew up in a Christian home. It's easy for my children, because they grew up in a Christian home. It's easy for me, it's easy for the people that I know, personally. But for a lot of people, it's not easy. You know, it's, it's very hard for some people. You know, it's very hard for people to reject the lies that they've been told their whole life. It's very hard for people to reject the idea that their self-righteousness is not going to get them to heaven. Okay? It's very hard. Um, you know, I was thinking of a man that I got to preach the gospel to. It was very hard. He, he saw what I was teaching him. He believed it was... Well, he was saying, look, I, I, I can see what you're saying. It seems to be the most logical answer to salvation. But it was hard for him to believe it. Because to believe it, he would have to accept that his parents would die and go to hell. It's hard for some people to believe. But whether it's easy to believe for some, whether it's hard to believe for others, whether it's somewhere in between, it doesn't matter. The, the important thing is, it's belief. Okay? Easy believism, hard believism, somewhere in the middle believism, it's believism. Okay? It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's easy for some. Now, whether it's easy or whether it's hard, here's the simple. Here's the here's the fact about it all. It's simple. Okay, it might it might be hard, but it's still simple. If it's easy, it's still simple. And uh, I'm just I'm starting to wrap up now, guys. But let me just read to you Second Corinthians chapter eleven, verse three. Okay, and this is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. He says, "But I fear." So Paul had a fear, lest by any means. As the serpent beguiled Eve, Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted 
from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul had a fear that the church would maybe uh, be corrupted in their minds and reject the simplicity that is in Christ. Salvation is simple, guys. It's believe on Christ, he's done all the work. And unfortunately, there are churches today that have been deceived by the devil. They have rejected the simplicity and they've added works to the gospel. Okay? And um, next week, if I'm here, I'm going to go through a lot of these works that are being preached by churches that ought to know better. Um, I think I'll wrap it up there. Actually, let's turn to Hebrews 11. Turn to Hebrews 11, verse 1. Let's just finish with this very quickly. As long as my voice holds out. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Because one question that often comes up is, what's the evidence of salvation? Right? What's the evidence? And usually when people ask that question, do you know what they're asking? Where are the works? (laughs) Where are the works? Because for them, the works are the evidence of salvation. And yet, what do we learn? What's salvation? Without the works of the law. It's by faith. Now think how crazy that is. For, to say that salvation is without, is without works. And then to say, but I don't know if you're saved if you have the works. Why? If it's without the works, what do you need to be saved? Faith. To believe in Christ. So what's the evidence of salvation? That someone has believed in Christ. Is, am I, is that not common sense? <laughs> I mean, if the Bible says it's not of works... Why would you be looking for works as the evidence then? Look at, it, look at Hebrews 11 verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1. And this is the only time the word evidence comes up in the New Testament. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. If, I, if you look at me, you, you know, if you saw me walking down the street, you wouldn't know if I'm saved or not. You know, you, if I helped an old lady cross the street... Right? You saw me helping an old lady cross the street. Does that prove I'm saved? No. Because why? Because salvation is not based on works. But if you spoke to me and said, Hey, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? And I said to you, I've placed all my faith. You know, and I realize that it's not my works of righteousness. It's not my ability to, be, to keep myself from hell. But Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, was buried for those three days and three nights, rose again from the dead sacrificed his blood, shed his blood for all mankind, and he's asked me to put my faith and trust on him, and that's what I've done. I've called upon the name of the Lord for salvation. If I gave you that testimony, would you not then know that I'm saved? Yeah, because faith is the evidence. And other people that can lie and say, yeah, there's probably people that can lie, but look, most often they're not. People that can say that with a straight face, that is by faith on Jesus Christ, they're saved. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaker. Okay, so please don't get confused. I know this group's not going to get confused that it's salvation by works, but what can happen, and I've seen happen, people get confused and think, "Well, I can judge someone's salvation by their works." When it's not even by works, that's just the craziest thing to think of, right? Anyway, thanks for your patience. Uh, let's pray, uh, Heavenly Father, Lord. I thank